Um, good evening, everybody. I'm really happy to have you tonight uh, for this last conference of the first chapter of our series on international human rights. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to have Antagise tonight uh, for us, uh, directly from Phnom Penh, or almost. International lawyer. <laughs> exactly, international lawyer, international superstar. Um, <laughs> slightly controversial, but I, mean, I think that's why the discussion is going to be extremely interesting tonight. So I hope you're all well prepared, that you all prepared questions, are a bit aware of you know, the latest of the trial in Cambodia. But if we're not, and in case you are not, we'll be showing a movie that will explain you and give you a little bit of background on what Anta is doing. So without any further ado, please welcome Anta Gisse. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I'm the one delighted to be here. I mean, uh, it's a beautiful place to be invited to. Um, Warning, my English is not that good, uh, so I will make mistakes, and I'm sorry, but um, hopefully with my sexy French accent, you will forgive me. Um, what I wanted to um, share tonight is uh, a bit of uh, another perspective on uh, my work, uh, because everybody uh, hears about trial, international trial, and uh, you, you see, and I'm sure you see, um, uh, the lawyer has uh, bad people, I mean, saying stupid things uh, to defend their client uh, by any means. Not exactly that. I, I hope I'm doing a better job. Uh, to be complete, I must say that I was uh, a little bit a spoiled kid to, uh, today because uh, the first uh, topic uh, which was proposed to me was um, defending the indefendable. And uh, I wanted to change because uh, I don't believe there is uh, such thing as uh, an indefendable person. Uh, and that's why I, I, I changed it to um, defending the presumed guilty because that's ac actually the main uh, issue that uh, we have to face in, um, in a defense team. Uh, as defense lawyers, uh, we know that when we appear in court compared to uh, any other court in the world, when our client is coming, is presumed guilty. And that's why everybody thinks uh, he is indefendable, but he's not. Nobody is indefendable. It's a question, it's a philosophical uh, point of view. I think uh, as a human being, as a citizen, uh, I think everybody uh, has the right to be um, defended. And also, I think also that uh, we are human. Justice is a human. Tribunals are um, composed of judges which are human, the accused are human, the civil, the victims are human, the defense lawyers are human, and the accused are human. It means that behind every accused person, you have a family, you have an history, you have um, uh, a story uh, um, about how he became uh, this man or uh, she became this woman uh, in this courtroom. And I think as a defense lawyer, that's my job uh, to talk uh, about this human part, this human side of the accused. And in this kind of case, um, it's also my role to give another perspective, another vision of uh, the man and also the history and the case we are talking about. So before um, gain, going deeper on uh, what my job is, I think it would be important to for you to have um, a general idea of what is uh, criminal law and what uh, was the history uh, behind all this um, criminal, criminal court. And uh, there is a, a video which was made by um, an NGO that I like very much, uh, uh, which, called, which is called um, Destination Justice. Uh, it's based in Phnom Penh. Um, it's not the president, but the person in charge um, is uh, a French Khmer, French Cambodian, um, uh, lawyer and uh, his, uh, his wife uh, is also a lawyer, very, in, uh, very involved in uh, promoting uh, international criminal court and she also works in the defense team uh, uh, in my case. So just to let you know that uh, being a defense uh, uh, lawyer or being, uh, working for defense doesn't mean that we are uh, defending or supporting any crimes, it's just we are here to, um, to, 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 to allow the discussion to take place in court. Thank you.
now see a few of the sights we saw, and much as they may shock you, do believe me when I tell you that the reality was indescribably worse than these pictures. In 1975, the communist Khmer Rouge regime, led by a former school teacher named Pol Pot, began to decimate the country's population through a systematic campaign of forced labor, starvation, and murder. The story of Srebrenica may seem to be a freakish throwback to medieval savagery. But it's essentially a story of our times. The most time-efficient genocide in history began. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. In the last century, around 200 million people died because of a conflict. 200 million. This is, for example, around the entire population of Brazil or Indonesia. The footage you have just seen is only a small representation of a global phenomenon. Even now, in this new century, conflicts and mass atrocity crimes are still plaguing mankind. Since the Second World War, and after each conflict, the international community has found itself shocked, always seeking new ways to address these issues in order to ensure that they never happen again. Is it possible they do not realize that we shall never cease to persevere against them until they have been taught a lesson which they and the world will never forget. On Thursday the 18th of October 1945 in Berlin, the indictment was lodged with the tribunal. Thus spoke Lord Justice Lawrence on day one of the ten-month drama now ended at Nuremberg. To answer came Goering, except for Hitler, head of the Nazi state. Now he will die, hanged by the neck like a common criminal. Mr. President, the witness Nishio has been sworn and signed the oath of witness. Today we begin to cleanse the hatred that has torn apart the former Yugoslavia. A few months ago I said, this will be no victor's tribunal. The only victor that will prevail in this endeavor is the truth. Truth is the cornerstone of the rule of law and it will point towards individuals, not peoples, as perpetrators of war crimes. And it is only the truth that can cleanse the ethnic and religious hatreds and begin the healing process. The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia is now in session. Thousands of males were detained in horrific conditions and subsequently summarily executed. Proposing a resolution to establish a tribunal which could lead to the trial and punishment of those individuals who were responsible for the genocide. The magnitude of the crimes could not go unpunished. Between a half and one million people may have been slain in Rwanda in little over three months. La Chambre d'appel siégeante en audience publique rejette à l'unanimité chacun des motifs d'appel présentés par Jean-Paul Akayesu. Confirme la culpabilité de Jean-Paul Akayesu sur l'ensemble des chefs d'accusation retenus contre lui et confirme la condamnation à l'emprisonnement à vie prononcée. The Secretary General and Sam Dekinson have agreed that the signing will be after the law has been adopted in, in Parliament. 
but we have to see to it that all the paperwork is properly done uh, before I, I leave uh, this time. So this is all I have to say. So are you optimistic that uh, the both sides uh, finalize the everything remaining uh, before the National Assembly? Uh, we, we are working in a positive spirit as we did in March and uh, I think that uh, we will uh, have a good meeting now and I hope that we will cover all the issues that uh, we have set out on our agenda. Case 002. The trial chamber continues the hearing of evidence which began on December 5, 2011, following opening statements. The trial, for which survivors have been waiting more than three decades, has finally begun. The establishment of these tribunals have followed several trends influencing the development of international criminal justice. You have just seen examples of victor's justice with the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals. You have seen examples of peace establishment and truth-seeking with the tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. And finally, you have seen an example of balancing victim's justice and political stability with the Khmer Rouge Tribunal in Cambodia. All of these tribunals and others have fed the development of international criminal justice. They have led to the idea that a permanent international criminal court could draw from these institutions successes and failures to achieve a better justice. In 1998, people from all over the world gathered in Rome to attempt something that had never been done, create the basis for a permanent international criminal court. In 1998, during the Rome Diplomatic Conference on the International Criminal Court, 160 countries negotiated a treaty to design the world's first permanent international criminal court. Well, will now be closed. The machine is now closed. On the 17th of July, 1998, after five weeks of intense negotiations, 120 nations voted in favor, and on July the 1st, 2002, the Rome Statute entered into force after ratification by 60 countries. The International Criminal Court represents hope. Hope that mass atrocity crimes will no longer be left unpunished. Hope that justice will eventually prevail. International criminal justice is becoming universal because more than hope, there is a need for the world to have one fair, effective, independent and permanent criminal court. One that respects the highest standards and is dedicated to the fight against impunity. The ICC represents the best opportunity for the world to find the truth and guarantee that victim's justice will prevail over victor's justice. Court has a mandate to try individuals aged 18 and above at the time the crimes were committed and to hold them accountable for the most serious crimes of concern to the international community, that of genocide, war crimes and crimes against the humanity committed after the 1st of July, 2002. I, Fumiko Saiga, solemnly undertake that I will perform my duties and exercise my powers as a judge of the International Criminal Court honorably, faithfully, impartially, and conscientiously et que je respecterai le caractère confidentiel des enquêtes et des poursuites. And the secret of the deliberation. The ICC's judges are chosen among persons of high moral character, impartiality and integrity, who possess the qualifications required in their respective countries for appointment to the highest judicial offices. They are elected by the countries that are parties to the ICC to represent not only the major legal systems of the world, but also its diversity. An ICC judgeship is for nine years and is not renewable. This helps to ensure the judges are in a position of real independence, 
serving justice over any other considerations. Mr Lubanga has been convicted of having committed, jointly with others, the crimes of conscripting and enlisting children under the age of 15 and using them to participate actively in hostilities in the context of an internal armed conflict. Hakuna mwae, baka kwa kapali kuyumba, likia ni kamata kuyumba, ni kwa kuyumba, ni kwa natuanga, ni kwa tuanga sombe. Kusanya ule wale wa soda wa litiaka. Bazazi yangu wako pale pembeni, baka haona gisi naenda. Si nilikuwa kabado si ya uwa mutu, mbilo kwanza kwa mata bunduki nilitetemi kaka, maike nilikuwa kasafi ya umuena tetemeka mbilo kwa mata ile bunduki me. Ewa, vitu ya mafele bilikuwa kabisa ile moya ni kweli, vitu ya mafele bilikuwa kwa, tuliona vya mingi, na sipende naisha tu participant kusema. Upende usipopenda, watakia taba ine, watano, auna ngufi ya kukatala juu, vana ume watano wakisha kukuhia frema, auna tamwa ya kukatala. Awezi kwa sadu nilifanya kwa miaka mbili silifupi. Nifanya kwa miaka mbili na nilibishi yeko kila saa na kila siku. Awe, mpaka zi mungeki mwakili yangu. In accordance with the majority decision, Mr. Lubanga is sentenced to a total period of 14 years imprisonment, from which the time commencing with his surrender to the court on the 16th of March 2006 is to be deducted. This was the first verdict of the International Criminal Court. Congolese warlord Thomas Lubangadilo was convicted for crimes against humanity and war crimes and sentenced to 14 years of imprisonment. He will not be the last person to face international justice. These people are currently facing trial at the International Criminal Court. Some others are still on the run, even defying the arrest warrants issued against them. Nayachi <laughs> timbi. Mbiye kionko zu, na yachi kodro ni hape, e na yachi kodro timbi iti mungumba aku hape, son trafik en general. Mbiye ke zu, me azo a mumbi tonga na nyama, na leti ala. During the previous century, millions of people many of them children, were victims of unimaginable atrocities. The International Criminal Court symbolizes the hope that by ending impunity for such crimes, we might prevent their occurrence and contribute to the peace, security, and well-being of the world. Yes, it um, was uh, difficult uh, images to see, um, difficult um, witnesses to hear, testimony to hear. And uh, even though the people who are uh, brought to the court, whatever court it is, has to have a fair trial. And what is the fair trial when it comes to um, inter international criminal law? Because you see all these um, difficult images of bodies uh, on the floor, of, um, uh, of uh, children, women murdered, and you see, wow, why, why do they need uh, a defense?
first uh, thing first, we have the principle of law and uh, we are supposed to be in a, in a society where uh, looking uh, uh, for democracy, um, looking for um, um, human rights and the application uh, for human rights for everybody. But uh, most of all, uh, in this uh, course, you have this specificity of uh, um, sometimes a big gap between the crimes as they were committed and the people who are brought to court. Most of the time, the people you see in court are not the ones who have committed uh, the crimes themselves. They were in a position of power. They were in a position of power in society, civil society, in the army, and what uh, um, the charges are against, who are, which are against uh, them, is not he took his weapon or his machete or he raped himself. No, it's because he gave order or he put a policy in place which allowed uh, this to this to happen. And that's why the first, um, uh, the first uh, conviction uh, before ICC that the comment Sophie made to me it was like 14 years. It doesn't seem Much. very important, no. But once again, it's not the man who committed the crimes himself. It's because he was in a position, maybe uh, in a hierarchic uh, position uh, with the, 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 the person who committed the crime. Um, it's also uh, because he was responsible of the armed conflict which happened at the time in the country. So you have many reasons, and, and I th actually, in, in a defense point of view, that's what is interesting, because when you are dealing with this kind of cases, um, it's not, of course, uh, your job to say, yes, uh, genocide is great, or yes, crimes humanity is great, no. Of course, we are all in the court of Rome, we are all lawyers, and uh, we condemn the crimes. The question is, as in any other trial, you have to uh, discuss about the uh, responsibility, the liability of, of your clients. It means when, it talks, when we talk about um, policy, was he involved in the creation of the policy? What was the position, uh, what was his position within uh, uh, the system? Because, and that may be the, the, big, uh, the biggest issue in criminal law. Many times when you go uh, before court, people want to judge a symbol. You were the one representing the state. You were, so they are talking about moral responsibility, but when we are in a court of criminal law, we are talking about individual responsibility, and we're talking about one man, we're not talking about one system. Of course you're talking about the system when you want to explain how the things happened, uh, what were uh, the conflicts, uh, what was the issue at stake, how, um, Maybe orders may have been given to whomever committed the crime. But when you're going in the courtroom and when you're a defense lawyer, you're defending a man. And the man is not necessarily guilty. Even though everybody thinks he is, he might not be. And the interesting thing um, is that, uh, for example, before um, ITTR, International Crim um, Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, you had this uh, amazing thing that happened that people were acquitted. And people did not think about the possibility of acquittal. Oh yes, there was a provision, a provision in the text which said if somebody is acquitted, is released, but nothing else. And there is this situation right now, after their trial, after spending uh, several years in jail uh, waiting for their trial, people are released, there is a decision, definitive decision saying that they, are, was, they were not guilty, but they are still prisoner in the country where the, the, the trial uh, took place, I mean uh, Tanzania, because obviously they can't go back to uh, Rwanda because they are uh, from the former power. There's a new power in place which um, is not very pleased by the way with the acquittal, and they can't go back to their country, they can't go back either to uh, the places where uh, most of the time their family have um, found refuge because most, many people from the former power are refugees all over the world. But 
the, the other countries don't want either to welcome them because they're afraid of what might happen uh, with the relation uh, with the Rwanda or with uh, uh, people uh, who are victims of the former regime and who might not be happy to have somebody, yes, acquitted, but that's the, that's the thing. You were presumed guilty, you were judged, and even if you are acquitted, you're still presumed guilty. And that's um, maybe what is interesting um, in the defense, on the defense side, is also to, 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 to give uh, the vision of, um, okay, we want to judge crimes. Okay, it's awful what happened. We are not discussing that. And it's very important to understand that not, it happens, huh? but not every lawyer is a revisionist. Not every lawyer thinks genocide did not occur. Not every lawyer thinks that uh, uh, um, a, civ um, a victim is, is nothing, no. It's uh, very, very rare indeed, and uh, most of the time, the question is, it happens, but what is the responsibility of my client? You also have another um, job to do as a lawyer. You're talking about crimes, you're talking about responsibility, but you're also talking about a context. I'm right now currently um, defending uh, the former head of state of uh, Cambodia, Mr. Kusampan, and uh, the jurisdiction of uh, uh, the tribunal for, for Mark Khmer Rouge starts from 75 to 79. So he is judged for these facts precisely. And uh, one of the main uh, charges uh, charged uh, again against him was uh, a policy which um, brought uh, millions of people to starvation, and they decided to start the trial from 75 to 79. As a defense lawyer, when I pleaded this case uh, uh, at the first instance, my role was not to say that nobody died in Cambodia, but to have also a more general view. You know, you may not know, but uh, Cambodia, what happened in Cambodia is very linked to what happened in Vietnam. Because um, when there was a war um, between Vietnam and United States, many uh, Vietnamese uh, fighting the United States took refuge in Cambodia. So there was a help from Cambodian people one part of Cambodian people, communist people of Cambodia, uh, helps the Vietnamese fighting the Americans. And there was huge bombing who took place in Vietnam and in Cambodia. A really huge bombing. And in the case, because our, also our role is to uh, discuss um, the evidence we have in the case, and in the case we had, for example, an evidence that when they took power, when the Khmer Rouge uh, took power in 75, 80% of uh, the surface which could be used uh, for agriculture was destroyed because of the bombing and because of the war that took place. 80%. So, of course, we are going to talk about starvation between 75 and 79, but as a lawyer, I have to say, you are saying that my client purposely uh, drove millions of people to starvation, but can, you, can we please uh, talk about the fact that there was only 20% of, uh, uh, of the surface where you could have agriculture to provide food for the people? So that's an example of um, discussions that you can have uh, um, in court. It's just to have a more general vision because in reality, uh, truth is less thematic as um, people want to, to show it. Um, I always say that um, there is no such thing uh, as truth. There is no one truth. You have um, different um, pieces of truth depending on who talks about the story, depending on um, who wants to tell the story. 
Because once, once again, if I take the example of uh, Cambodia, when we are going to court and we, only, we are only allowed to talk about the responsibility of people between 75 and 79, it's because we don't want to talk about the war in Vietnam before, and we don't want to talk about the arri arrival of uh, Vietnamese after that. There is this choice of uh, period to talk about, and it brings me to what we just saw. Um, when we are going to court, and when a court is established um, at the international level, of course, people want justice, but before everything, it's a political will. A political will of, yes, the general international uh, opinion, as they say. Political will, most of the time, of United Nations. And it means political will of uh, uh, Security Council, which means a few countries sometimes. And United States, China, France, Britain, everything. When, when, when you talk, when you hear about what happens now, uh, when they want to take a resolution about uh, uh, Russia and Chechnya, or about uh, what happened uh, in Sudan or uh, in Syria or whatever, you can see that it's not easy. Uh, you just saw the people who are charged who, before ICC. You did not notice a problem. Only black faces. I mean, do we think really that in this world, uh, crimes against humanity or are only committed in Africa? No, but it's easier to bring people from Africa in court. And as a defense lawyer, it's also my role to denounce this kind of hypocrisy when um, there is such thing to say that we know that people are brought to court sometimes because it serves a political will. And they are from Africa, but not only are they from Africa, when you see every uh, person, except maybe in the Kenyan case, uh, where you had um, uh, a former and actual, actual uh, uh, head of state uh, who were uh, prosecuted. But uh, most of the time, when you go back to what is the political situation in the country, you can see that most of the time, the guy who is in court right now, in jail, uh, waiting for his... Um, is, uh, is trial, is a political opponent of somebody in place actually in the country. Another example on ICC. You saw, and it was actually quite moving to see these people crying, so happy to have this uh, permanent court, uh, the, symbol, the, the symbol of, uh, yes, no, never again, uh, we are going to fight uh, against crimes, uh, um, against genocide, and against impunity. Perfect. But who signed the Statute of Rome? Who signed, who signed the Rome Statute? No, no way for the United States. They did not want to lose their sovereignty. That's the main point they put forward. And uh, besides that, they don't want to sign, but they are trying to, uh, for not their friends, they, they, they did it actually. Indeed. They make a bilateral agreement to make sure that no American can be brought to, to the court in any case. One thing to know about uh, ITC, International Criminal Court, it's, it's, um, it's a court which is uh, a complementary one. It means that people are supposed to go to this court only if um, they are can't judge in their own country or there is no will to judge uh, the person which, which could be prosecuted uh, in their country. So once again, when we talk about justice, I mean, we have this uh, naive and uh, very nice and cute idea of uh, why well, justice international is so good. It's, yes, it, it can be. But as a defense lawyer, I can also tell you that it can be, uh, well, I shouldn't say bad word, but uh, it can be, say, very, very difficult uh, to, to, to agree with sometimes. Um, one example. International, in the International Tribunal, Tribunal for, for, for Wanda. Uh, I used to have some cases before the tribunal. And uh, in uh, the, the original um, uh, idea for this tribunal was to prosecute uh, both sides of uh, 
uh, of uh, the, par the party who were uh, fighting. Uh, the actual government uh, now, which is facing in Kigali, uh, was uh, uh, at war also, and they, there were also accusations of, um, of uh, crimes against humanity from, um, from their side. And at one point, the prosecution um, before ICTR tried to uh, induct someone uh, from this side, and then the court had to, had to stop completely because Rhonda said, oh, there's no way. If you want to prosecute this guy, I will just stop cooperation. No witness will come. Uh, we won't uh, allow people to make investigation in the country, etc., etc. So it meant that it would have been a stop to the court. And they decided to drop the prosecution. It wasn't a judicial decision. It was not because they didn't have elements to go on with the trial. It was because there was a political problem, and if they had gone on with what their with their initial uh, intent, well, ICTR would have uh, well, I don't know. Well, that was the idea at the time. They would have uh, to stop all the cases because there would have been a possibility, an impossibility, to go on with the cooperation with Rwanda. So maybe sometimes, um, well, they decided to uh, go back, I mean, to drop the case. I don't know if the history would have been better if uh, they had tried to fight and tried to find the support of uh, United Nations, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, well, they decided not to do it. And now you have one side prosecuted. I didn't say that uh, there, was, there were no guilty, guilty person on the on the side prosecuted and uh, from, you know, with people who are judged. But when uh, you want uh, a real uh, judicial process, when you want, because that's what people say when they establish international courts, we want to have the truth, we want reconciliation, we want, to, people want so much from, uh, from these courts. But if you don't give um, um, uh, at least an image of uh, impartiality, at least an image of independence, you have this thing, like what you saw uh, about the images of black faces only uh, before ICT, and it's a bad, bad image. And it's so bad that, um, I don't know if you have followed, but recently, because uh, there was the prosecution of uh, one head of state, which is, I mean, besides the fact that uh, it's a problem, but it's also very, um, how do you say that, um, uh, shameful for a president to be, I mean, prosecuted by all uh, at the international level. It was so bad, and it has such a bad impact on uh, the public opinion, for example, in Africa, that there is now a campaign to ask um, uh, African countries to get out of the Rome Statute, to not have, uh, uh, to not have the possibility uh, of uh, ICT to just uh, be an African court uh, in disguise. So once again, when you talk about international criminal law, when you talk about international criminal courts, you're not talking about uh, lambda uh, criminal courts. It's not a question of uh, did he rape or did he stole that or did he kill? No, we are talking about political situation, political decision, and political um, effects when it comes to uh, the decisions which are going to be rendered by the jurisprudence. So once again, of course, um, it's very hard uh, to see this kind of images. Of course, it's very hard to um, be on the side of uh, the presumed guilty, but it's also very challenging because uh, and that's why I, actually I'm doing this job, um, because it, it gives you um, uh, a way of thinking, a different way of thinking. I mean, not to uh, be overwhelmed by only the appearances. I believe in the um, interesting uh, process of discussing, of debating in court. Um, I said that earlier, there's nothing uh, as such one truth. I think the job of uh, a good tribunal, of good judges, is to 
take all the pieces, all the discussion about the evidence which is um, brought to court, and to try to reach um, the closest thing uh, of what could be the truth. When people, and I'm sure among, uh, among you, uh, you have this thing, oh, I mean, she looks nice, but how can she do that? I mean, it's so wrong. No, it's not so wrong. It's so right to be able to do that. It's not only right, it's necessary. Because can you imagine a place where there's only one vision? Can you imagine a place where uh, only one type of voices can be heard? One of the challenges uh, I face as a defense lawyer is uh, that in court you have uh, yes, victims like the woman you saw on the screen who have suffered, I mean, no denial about the suffering she has, she, she went through, no denial at all. But most of the time when she talks about her suffering, she's not talking about my client because he was far away. So you have two things. You can discuss the um, um, reality and, uh, um, of the crimes because sometimes, and it's not because uh, it's a victim that uh, someone is a victim that he is or she is always telling the truth. It's like in every courtroom. Sometimes people are lying. Sometimes people are mistaking. Sometimes people are, are forgetting because, for example, in my case, it's, you're talking about things we, which happened 40 years ago. So when a guy says, oh, I remember this meeting. It was mm -hmm, in 73. It was in July. And I remember, okay, do you remember what you did uh, six months ago? So sometimes it just, you have to just to fight to try to understand, okay, it's not that reliable. Because once again, we are in, in um, we're in a criminal court, and uh, the doubt shall always benefit to the accused. So we, if we are not sure about something, it has to benefit to the accused. And that's my role as a lawyer, not have too many certainties. It's so important to be able to doubt. And I'm not talking, of course, I'm talking about um, criminal law, but in general, I mean, how many times have I heard that, how, may, how can you defend a pedophile? How can you defend? Okay, first of all, when somebody goes to court, he's not supposed to be guilty before there is a debate. Second of all, uh, if we were only to defend innocent people, I mean, what was the point of having a tribunal? What is the point? I mean, everybody in uh, uh, the course of our life, we might uh, face uh, people from our family committing, uh, committing crimes or committing uh, bad things. And uh, there are still people we, are, we love. In uh, a political uh, process uh, like uh, what, happened, uh, in, uh, what happened in Cambodia, you may have people who at the beginning had a very utopic idea of the society they wanted to build because I don't believe, at, at least for my clients, that uh, when he, he, he went uh, uh, to join the, the Khmer Rouge, uh, he wanted to destroy his people. The question is, when you are talking about uh, uh, what, uh, why your client has uh, done that and that, or what is his involvement and what was the idea at the beginning, it's very important to, have, to be open-minded and to be able to, to show it because it's not, there's never a black and white. We say there are many 50 shades of gray. <laughs> it's, more, it's more complex. It's really more complex. And people think we are the necessary evil. Sometimes people think, say, okay, let's say they are defense lawyers. If they could just not talk too much because uh, eh, we want to convict in peace. But uh, my role is to uh, prevent a conviction in peace if it means dis dis disregarding important elements we can use for the defense of, that cli of our client. And also, this, um, it's important not to show that it did not happen, but to show how it happened. Because if really the goal is to uh, prevent any other uh, dramatic situation like that, if uh, the idea is to go uh, to reach reconciliation, we have to understand how it happened. And not only how it happened between, for example, in 75 or 79, but how it happened because since the 60s, um, 
this were the policies. Um, there was colonialism, there was war, why people, uh, for example, and one example which is really interesting is, they say in my case that um, uh, the, the Khmer Rouge refused uh, international head after, after the end of the war. Yes, they refused international aid, but uh, they refused the aid of people who, are, who had bombed the country for several years. So is it easy for a country who wants its, its independence, etc., etc., to um, agree and to um, uh, accept uh, uh, the pseudo aid, pseudo aid of uh, another country which used to uh, destroy the country? So this is, I'm not saying that it's good or it's bad, I'm just saying that this is something I have to put forward. So I wanted to give you a general idea of different topics and different kind of um, thoughts that I had when I, um, I came to, to, to prepare to, to talk to you. I wanted to have, to, for you to have an, a less uh, schematic vision of things, and now you have the floor to put um, as many questions as you want. quite an eye-opening presentation that well, the least we can say. Um, so I hope there can be many questions. Uh, don't be afraid. She's a lawyer, but she's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> and open-minded, so she's ready to take any question you have. So don't feel, you know, any... Uh, oh, we have a first one. Wonderful. Um, just out of curiosity, what led you to um, become a defense lawyer for the International Criminal Courts? Uh, chance, actually. <laughs> it was, um, I used to work with um, Raphael Constant, um, which is um, uh, Martinique's lawyer, and uh, uh, he had a case before ICTR. At some point, somebody was looking for him at, at, um, at the time uh, a legal assistant, and I started in a case like that, and then after one case, two cases, I became um, a counsel. And it's a small world. I mean, people, I mean, international criminal law is, is, is a small world. Uh, when you work on a case, people are working on other case. They think about you because they know how you work, and that's it. But I used to be, and I still am, a criminal lawyer uh, at the domestic level. And I really like criminal law because, once again, I think it's good to try to understand things. Well, first of all, thank you. And secondly, um, just kind of stepping back to right to before you even started working for the um, International Criminal Courts, I was wondering what, um, like when you developed this perspective about being able to see all these sides. Because as you mentioned, so many people see that as the being a defense lawyer as the necessary evil. And I'm wondering if you came to defense law before taking on that perspective that looks at so many more things or after. Yeah, okay, I'm, uh, I have to talk about myself, oh, it's too bad. <laughs> um, my father is from Senegal, and my mother is from uh, Martinique, which is a French department, and I was born and raised in Paris. So it means that uh, I had the opportunity since I was a child to go to Africa, to go to Martinique, to live in France as a black woman, a uh, black child and black woman after that. Um, so it give, I think it gave me uh, of course, a, a way of seeing things not, I mean, uh, I'm used to adapt myself to other culture, other vision, etc. And um, I always, um, I mean, my father comes from a country which was colonized by France. My mother comes from an island where you had slavery. So I guess the history uh, of, of uh, what um, you can have when you are uh, um, persecuted or when you're exploited, I think. It, uh, it built me in a way, I think. And it also built me in a way to try to defend the people. I mean, I started, and now I'm, I'm, I'm defending uh, people accused of the worst crime, but I wanted to be a lawyer to defend the widow and the orphan at, at birth. And I'm still doing it anyway in other instances. But to have another vision and to not be convicted by only what um, um, the general opinion is, it's uh, really part of uh, how I grew up with parents who are activists in their own way. So I guess it, it, it started like this. 
From the information that I've gotten from this presentation, it seems to me that the ICC isn't a very effective method for a lot of these trials concerning what you were saying about in disguise of an African um, trial as well as the fact that the United States isn't a part of it. And I was curious about a few things, the first being what is your opinion on the validity of this as well as does it need more involvement from the United Nations as well as other international committees? My opinion, I, I don't, I'm not sure I have a, a definitive opinion on, on it. Uh, I believe that um, the fact that uh, there are political uh, issues, the fact that there are, there are uh, imperfection should not be a reason to say, oh, 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 nothing should happen. I think the idea behind it was good, but now the way it, uh, it has been applied is not that good because too much um, political interferences and too much um, maybe not uh, enough um, uh, independence on, in terms of uh, the possibility of action. Um, it's very interesting to um, listen to uh, Fatou Ben Souda, uh, the, the actual prosecutor before ICC. Um, many times she said, uh, okay, I have to drop that case because uh, there is no political will and I can't do my job properly. I can't go do the investigation. So if there is enough political will, uh, enough uh, mobilization for people to allow uh, the investigation to go on, even in countries where uh, well, it's not uh, that easy right now, it can change. I also think that um, uh, if um, public opinion, and I'm not talking about the people, the few, happy few who are interested in uh, international criminal law, but if more citizens were well, I mean, for example, we talked about Syria, uh, for example, uh, we talk about Sudan. Uh, I remember that when it, come, it came to the bombing uh, at some point, uh, when the conflict between Palestine and Israel, there was a discussion about it. There was no possibility of jurisdiction because Palestine is not a state and couldn't uh, sign at the beginning the, the, the Rome Statute. Um, the, the reality is uh, that there won't be an uh, easy solution because uh, we are not in an easy world. <laughs> uh, you can see what happened in Syria right now, what happened in Afghanistan, what happened. It's a question of um, uh, political mobilization of citizens. I mean, if you think your country is doing a bad thing, it's good to, you know, okay, I would like to try to change things. Or, Please, can you address this issue? Please, can we talk about it? Um, the, the other um, possibility uh, would also be for ICC, and I think it's uh, maybe that they are thinking about it. It's because, once again, it's a court which is only a complementarity, uh, which has a complementarity jurisdiction. It means uh, if ICC would uh, put much effort in uh, helping countries who don't, who don't have the means right now to establish their own court, maybe there, there would be more legitimacy uh, of the court. So I don't have a definitive opinion because uh, there are so much things out of my, my power <laughs> to change things like that. But um, as a defense lawyer, if I have to appear before ICCC, I will make sure that if there is a, a problem uh, in terms of um, uh, political decision, etc. And that's what they're doing right now. I would just yell uh, like, the, <laughs> like the lawyer I can be uh, when I think it's, uh, it's unfair. So we, we can't, um, but it's life. I mean, you're talking about uh, International Criminal Court, but it's also the same thing in uh, the country where you come from and when there is a policy which is not good. I mean, how do you do to change it? Of course, you don't have the position of power, but you have to commit yourself and try to do something. So it's step by step. But uh, if more people are raising their voice to act for more uh, fairness uh, and uh, more um, uh, less political uh, position uh, and more judicial position, maybe it, it, it can change at the end of the day. Another, oh, great. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, as I'm sure you know, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia imprisoned people and um, killed them without a fair trial. So I'm wondering, um, do you see irony inherent to your work defending someone who instituted policies that didn't allow people a fair trial? And if so, how do you combat that irony? Yeah, but, well, irony, yes, but what I say is, um, well, I'm against, for example, death penalty, even for people who are killed, because I think that uh, if we are in a court of law, we have to have higher standards. So it's not uh, uh, eye to eye, uh, it's, uh, we have to have political standards. And also, we are in 2015 uh, in a place, well, I'm not sure Cambodia is the best place even right now, but mm -hmm. in a courtroom which is supported by United Nations, so we have the higher standards. Um, I had the same, this almost same um, uh, question from a uh, Cambodian lawyer who, talk, who told me, uh, uh, don't you think it's unfair that uh, your client in prison has uh, three meals a day when people uh, in, the Cambod uh, in Cambodia don't have an, uh, uh, three, meal, three meals a day? And my answer to him was, uh, I mean, it's a problem if you live in a country where uh, people don't have uh, the standard, what is considered as the standard in a jail. So maybe you should address that. So we shouldn't mix um, all the issues. The fair trial um, is a principle to whom you can judge people. We don't know, once again, when you go to court, even if now he was convicted at 13 cents for one part uh, of the case and now we are on appeal. But when you go to court, uh, you just said uh, we, he, he has established the policy. Well. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's a, a debate. Uh, it's a debate. So we, you can't, you can't um, uh, have a, a trial with the idea of, uh, yeah, but because it's this kind of guy, uh, well, I don't want to apply the rule. Sometimes uh, it's uh, difficult to understand that uh, rules are to be applied to everybody, but this is the backbone of democracy. This is the backbone of a fair system, and this is the backbone of um, our human rights. How are you doing? Fine, <laughs> thanks. I thought I should ask. Um, I wanted to know um, like, what your opinion is on the refugees fleeing from their countries due to starvation, wars, um, no type of work. Uh, not only your opinion, um, but maybe some resolutions um, to this issue. Wow. Uh, big question. Um, well, uh, as I said, um, uh, my father is um, from Senegal, so uh, I know uh, I've visited many places in Senegal, very poor places in Senegal, and I totally understand why people feel the need to escape economic, economical situation or war situation, and um, um, we live in a global world. I mean, when we talk about uh, globalization of the world, uh, you can't have uh, so many um, means in one part of the world and think that people will stay uh, in uh, their bad situation without trying to improve their, their life. So of course, it's gonna be a trouble. So I don't think the solution is, at the end of the day, everybody coming in Europe and, uh, no. I think it's just, a way to remind people that if you're still um, keeping with some policies, for example, what we have in Syria right now, or the refugees coming from Libya, etc., is the direct result of political decisions which were taken by big ones, France, United States, whatever. Um, and you can't uh, provoke uh, some situation, economical or uh, war situation in the world and think that it will never uh, come back to you. Right. So I really believe that um, it's just uh, a manifestation of how everything is linked. So if you have to uh, address the issue, you have to address, uh, of course, about how you're welcoming people here, but also how you solve the solution, so the solve the problem uh, at the source. So as um, my father came for, to study in France, but he was very, uh, it was very important for him to go back to Senegal to work for the country. Uh, but he was an intellectual. But when you are a farmer and there is a drought, uh, war, 
or uh, problem um, in, in your country and the only mean uh, for you to help your family is to come and uh, work in a dirty kitchen in a restaurant, yes, you do it. It's probably troubling for the people uh, who are in Europe, say, oh, you're taking my job or whatever, but it's the direct result of the situation, which is a global one. So I don't have a solution. I just know that um, uh, it will go on as long as there is no um, uh, global thinking out what are the causes of everything. Uh, hi. Um, I just have one question. Uh, is there any specific case that you've done like recently or maybe you know far back that kind of changed the way you like practiced or changed the way you looked at your job? Kind of a broad question, but. Hmm. Hello. Hmm. I'm not sure there was one case. Um, it's more like several moments. Um, I remember um, when I was uh, uh, working um, in a case before uh, for ICTR, like a tribunal for Rwanda, and there was the possibility of prepping witnesses in that case, which is not the case in, uh, for the tribunal in Cambodia. And uh, I was, uh, I mean, the, the, the person who, who, I mean, was very little bit slow in answering the question, and I was, and I was, uh, I mean, I had time, time was raining, I needed to work on other things, and uh, I got a little bit pissed. And then I realized <laughs> the guy is taking his time to talk to me and uh, talk about the difficulties it has faced. And uh, I'm pissed because uh, I'm running late on uh, my brief or whatever, and it just um, gave me the perspective that, okay, I'm, um, I'm a defense lawyer. <coughs> But I should ne shall never forget that um, uh, I'm just um, a, a part of a tribunal when people are coming to talk about their lives, and I have to have respect for that. So that was one moment. Um, one maybe big moment also was um, when I uh, pleaded this case uh, before Cambodia. The first, the first moment when you know it's uh, very strange when you know that everybody's against you, that whatever, whatever you're going to say, they, they might not want to hear you. And to have the challenge, say, okay, you don't want to hear me, but let me try to get to you in a way. And uh, I really liked it. I mean, that's the moment I know why I'm doing this job. It's because it's more than, uh, there's no, not at all, I mean, in my case, maybe for male it's different, but for my case, there's no question of ego. When I'm in court, it's not a question of about me, it's a question of my clients, it's a question, you have to have respect for um, the history you are talking about. I'm not Cambodian, I'm uh, French uh, from African descent, but I'm talking uh, in a courtroom where you have people from Cambodia uh, who are listening to me. You have also my client who has his own history, who um, made uh, at some point some uh, uh, some choices and uh, uh, some uh, political decision even before the, the facts which, uh, which is why he's prosecuted. And uh, I have to remember, okay, I mean, this guy, I mean, people might not like him, but when uh, he was, uh, he went to, he, 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 he lived for several years uh, in the forest uh, facing uh, uh, bombings, uh, he decided he could have been, uh, he was um, an intellectual, he could have uh, followed the steps of uh, uh, other people and tried to win money, etc. And that, um, I think, is very important to each step to respect the story of people who are defending, but also people who are linked to the case. So there are tiny moments like that where you, you have uh, you have uh, like an epiphany, okay, okay. It's interesting, but it's not interesting because uh, I can be so smart in court or uh, It's very interesting because you are part of a process to try to make people understand something. And uh, I think this kind of cases, I mean, change, uh, change uh, the way of um, uh, practicing my, my profession just in a way that it gave me more, um, uh, it shed more light on the importance of uh, uh, trying to understand. Well, we, we, we have a lady in the front, and then the, the, the student over there. <laughs> the student wearing glasses. Yeah. 
Um, so I thought it was um, interesting, the separation of moral responsibility and legal responsibility. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak more about um, the, the legal, um, I guess, weight of intentions and like how um, you separate um, people who may have started something that ended with a genocide that was not the original intent. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then also kind of um, how you hold somebody accountable, like how many degrees of separation are like necessary to hold someone accountable. Mm -hmm. um, so like a leader for the soldiers on the yeah. ground. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's the whole discussion actually. In this kind of case, that's the main discussion that you have um, to put because um, in that case, uh, especially, well, there was the first part. In, in, in the case I'm dealing in uh, before um, uh, ECCC, Extraordinary Chambers uh, in the Court of Cambodia, so ECCC, um, you had a severance of the case. Uh, one part uh, was already judged, and we have a second part. On the first part, it was easier because you were talking about the responsibility of my clients, his position, etc. In the second part, we are dealing with a site of crimes where he has never been, never put a, a foot in the place. And of course, um, you know that the real discussion is not, go be, not going to be here. Of course, you are challenging the evidence. If somebody is lying about how it happened, you're trying to do the cross-examination, etc. But you know that at the end of, at the, end of the day, you are going to have this discussion about uh, responsibility and uh, the link between your client and the fact. Uh, I'm going to talk about it tomorrow um, in more detail, but there is this um, new notion which uh, was born in uh, international criminal court because they thought that it was important to be able to punish uh, moral responsibility, uh, which, call, which is called um, joint criminal enterprise. It's another form of conspiracy, conspiracy, but which has, as a different scenario, I think, a big problem, which is you, are, you can remove or, I mean, diminish the link between the fact and the crime and the intention and the intent. And for me, it's, uh, for me, it's um, legal monstrosity because if there was no intent, yes, it's happened, but there's no intent, how can I be criminally liable? And, uh, well, in this case, it's maybe um, easier because, well, easier, not easier, but different because we are talking about facts between 75 <laughs> and 79, with, uh, at the time, a state of law where joint criminal enterprise was, wasn't as wide as it is now. But for cases right now, um, it's very difficult for a, a lawyer to, to, to uh, to discuss properly about uh, joint criminal enterprise and the liability of uh, his client when you can remove, I mean, you can remove the prosecution and the judges can remove the, the notion of intent in the crimes. And for me, it's, uh, it's a nonsense uh, in terms of criminal, uh, in criminal law. Well, so it's a fight. Uh, I know that um, ICC has not... Um, uh, well, we'll see maybe uh, with the years, but the, the notion, the, the, the lighter notion of joint criminal enterprise, which allows uh, the intent to be quasi removed, uh, has not been uh, accepted, I think, by uh, ICC, which is a good thing. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a big headache uh, for, uh, for lawyers uh, <coughs> in that sense, yes. I'm Professor student as yeah, well. She, she's my student, but she never kept come to class. <laughs> so back to this. So not, <laughs> well, not likely to get a very greater. good grade. But um, so I, I agree with you that it's very problematic that politics enters into prosecutorial decisions who to prosecute. I think we would be hard pressed to find any court anywhere in the world where politics wasn't influential in prosecutions. I also completely agree that. Um, there is responsibility to be assigned to the United States for its bombing of Cambodia. But do either of those problems um, address or uh, present a defense 
um, against the criminal res the potential criminal responsibility of your client or anyone else in Cambodia for policies that did contribute to or could have contributed to uh, starvation. Are either of those two kind of broader political concerns important in that in that trial? Hmm. Uh, of course. Um, when I talk about the context and the bombing, it's not the only defense that we have. <laughs> we have um, several things. One other, um, one other explanation uh, of what happened was um, the way, <coughs> well, let me start like this. When people are talking about uh, Khmer Rouge, everybody thinks it's a monolithic movement with no, I mean, you're talking about Khmer Rouge, you're talking about all, one Khmer Rouge, you're talking about all, the whole Khmer Rouge. It's not that simple. Um, in the way they came to power, in the way they were uh, created, you have this kind of zones in Cambodia with uh, military, um, uh, military responsible uh, at the head of each zone. And you can see that there are, of course, there was general problem all over the place, but you have disparities in the way people were treated depending on the zone and depending on the people who are in, in charge of, um, of uh, dealing with this part or this part. So for my client, who was never in charge of zone, one of the main difference is to say there was this general policy, which is uh, anyway not the way uh, you depicted it, uh, when I say you, I mean the prosecution. <coughs> but also, you have to take into account that it wasn't a monolithic movement, and you can't say that he is responsible of everything that happened because people at the local level had their own responsibility. So it's one also of the defense. And also that's why it's interesting when I'm saying that, for example, in the second part of the case right now, I'm talking about, uh, we are talking about things where, for places where the client has never been. So when I'm in court, my challenge is to understand, okay, who was in charge? How was, uh, who, who decided that and that and that? And at the end of the day, it's to discuss the, the link between the decision as they were taken at the local level and the link with my, with my client. So it's, um, of course, it's complex. It has so many, so many, so many uh, reasons why it did not, uh, uh, the policy did not work or why the, the policy were. So when you think about, uh, yes, one, one um, well, the, the, because people are uh, peasant, uh, people are farmers, they are necessarily good and uh, necessarily pure in terms of uh, the way they are going to handle things. It was a very, very naive way of thinking uh, uh, of the people. But once again, we were uh, in another time where you had other ideas. Uh, and, um, and also, um, we were in a country which was so uh, uneducated in, in general that uh, when you give power, when you give power sometimes to people who are not educated and who have a very uh, Manichaean vision of life, you can also um, go, um, reach um, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, <coughs> of problems uh, on the field. Um, have you ever been have you ever either viewed a trial or, or uh, sorry, a case, or could you imagine a case where you couldn't imagine defending Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, I think, yes, that was what I wanted to say um, uh, at the first place, that when I say there is n nobody is indefendable, it doesn't mean I can defend everybody. Yeah. That's very important, and, and that's the beauty of the, uh, of, uh, the profession uh, uh, of lawyer. It's, you can choose uh, the people you are defending. So if you don't feel like defending somebody because uh, uh, you think, it, well, it's even your duty not to defend him because it means that if you don't feel like it, you won't do a, <laughs> a good, good job. job. Uh, but also, for example, I, I'm, for me, it's easier to defend someone the, uh, like the client that I have, uh, que saint -Pain, who was a revolutionary at some point and who had a utopia, whatever you think about his utopia. Ethiopia, it's, it, it's better for, it's easier for me to defend someone like this than to defend um, a former uh, dictator who, I mean, uh, used his power to steal the money in this country and uh, it's easier for me because uh, I think I will, uh, I will be 
in a better place to uh, use arguments to understand that for people who just want money to just to be rich and to um, have power uh, just for power uh, I don't think I would be a great uh, lawyer but it's, it's because it's less complex as well and you don't like the situation where it's black and yeah, white maybe. you know yeah, so you won't true. you won't go into the intricacies of the human yeah. mind and that's true I mean I, I did this job to yeah. work with people really I couldn't have done corporate law even though I would be richer but um, uh, I think it's um, well it's all yes yeah, so philosophical, philosophical it's, it's uh, point thinking. of view it's the uh, law I mean a courtroom is supposed to make you understand things and if you understand things, uh, it means that the world maybe can be better because uh, if you have, if you understood, it might not repeat uh, the same way it happened. Well, yeah, it's a little bit naive because uh, it happens again, but um, at least, and once again, when I said um, uh, it's very important to respect people uh, and the story you are talking about, uh, when I pleaded in this, uh, this case, uh, it was very important for me to uh, acknowledge uh, to say at some point, uh, that's not my job because they had their lawyers, but to talk about the victims and the civil party thing, I'm not deni den denying that, but what is the point of having a trial uh, where you want to convict people because you want to convict people when you know that there are so many other reasons why these things happen? So I think also, um, it's um, a good thing for uh, victims and civil parties in that case to have all the explanations they can have uh, about what happened because uh, yeah if we want to talk about um, uh, going on uh, and uh, understanding things uh, it's also a way uh, of doing it and it's even uh, my, my my job is more important in the sense that my client has uh, chose to remain silent especially in the this uh, second part he has talked a little bit uh, at some point he has talked so much before because he wrote books etc um, but uh, that's also the way of um, uh, being the voice of your client, not because you uh, agree with everything he has thought, or, uh, but just to understand and to make people understand that, yes, this is also an explanation, and uh, this is not what he wanted, and this is what could have happened, and this is what happened, and uh, yes, use also this explanation when you when you're, we are going to give your decision even though I'm sure that the decision is already uh, made. <laughs> written, made, yes, uh, I know that, but sometimes you, you're not only working for this case, you're, working, you, you're also working for when people will go back and read uh, the transcripts of for the everything. For researchers. Yes, <laughs> for history, yes. For the historian and for the researchers. Yeah, but I'm not an historian, that's very important, I'm a lawyer, so I'm talking about a case and the evidence uh, which is the case. I'm not making a uh, thesis on what happened in Cambodia, no. I'm talking about were there enough elements to convict my client. <laughs> oh, not even like another chapter of the question? It's no, like exactly the ask, same? Yeah, I wanted Please. to ask basically like, you know, is there ever a time that, you know, you thought your, that, that an individual was guilty and like, you know, what, you, what did you do with the case? So yeah, it's the same question. As I said before, I mean, if a lawyer only uh, were, was to defend uh, innocent people, uh, I mean, the guilty one or the people who are appeared guilty are the people who are in mo most in need of a lawyer, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Uh, well, another round of applause.